This is the Hoops 8 Tournament Preview Show with Sports Director Travis Lee on Channel 8 WMTW. Well, good evening and welcome to the Hoops 8 Tournament Preview Show. Dreams of state championships are a lifetime in the making, but for all of the players, coaches, and fans, those dreams were put on pause last year with no tournament. From the prelims down to goal ball Saturday, we'll have blow by blow, blow out the budget coverage of the main high school basketball tournament, Hoops 8. Every night of the tournament, make sure to tune in at 11 o'clock. Well, they say absence makes the heart grow fonder. Will that be the case for the state basketball tournament? After a year without tournament basketball, there have been big crowds throughout the regular season. For the fans, players, and coaches, a return to the tournament is another step in a return to normalcy. A year without the tournament left a void for many Mainers, including fans like Sonny Hebert, who's been attending games since 1951 when he won a state championship playing for Livermore Falls High School. You look at the schedule or you go no matter what? It doesn't make any difference. I get there early like I do here and I spend the evening there. Over the years, the tournament has made many memories for many Mainers. Spruce Mountain coach Scott Bessie knows what his players missed out on last year and wants them to soak it in this year. Well, I can vividly remember, you know, my tournament run, and uh, I'm the youngest of four brothers, so I was going to Jay Tiger games at the Civic Center, you know, when I was five, six years old, you know, watching the John Camellios, the thousand point score, and, and, and those games. So, I mean, it, it sticks with you, and they, they don't realize it now because they're kids, and kids don't listen to it. <laughs> you know, but they're going to remember this forever. For some players, there is no holding back their anticipation for the tournament, like Haldale's KK Wills, who's playing in her first. I have never been to the Civic Center in my four years of playing. Uh, we got upset my freshman year by Trape. The sophomore year, we only had a prelim and lost to NYA. Last year, we had the modified tournament and we ended up winning it all. And so I think it'd be really cool to make a really good run in our first time there. Two years ago, John Shea helped Edward Little win a state championship. He'll be one of the few players in the spotlight who has this type of big game experience. I remember going in my sophomore year and I was like, this is kind of crazy. I mean, just the atmosphere, the bigger the bigger arena, the bigger space, uh, the depth perception. It's all way different than what you're used to. This season has been anything but ordinary, but the tournament experience is something that is on the minds of the coaches who've had a front row seat for what the pandemic has done to their players. I mean, I think these kids, you know, they've sacrificed the most of the pandemic and um, for them to get a real tournament is something special for them and I'm looking forward for them to go through it because um, whether they succeed or win a state title or not, it's, it's getting back to competition and there's nothing like going to a venue, Civic Center, you know, the Expo or up in Bangor and playing in front of fans um, and competing. Now among the challenges this season was the shortage of officials. The available pool of referees, for instance, in the Western Maine board compared to pre-pandemic, down 30%. Now how will this have a direct impact on the tournament? Well, of the 105 officials who worked the last tournament in 2020, only 79 are available to work this one. So there's going to be quite a bit of turnover for tournament officials. Since 1996, the tournament has employed three-person crews to officiate games. But because of this year's shortage, that's going to impact the preparation of three-person crews. With the limited number of officials, that's not going to happen as much this year. So, and that's, that's a problem because that's where we do our training. You know, we have to get ready. We don't want to send people into the tournament not having worked crew of three because it's, it's, it's very different. Now, one of the stories within the story of each tournament is how the conferences collide in playoff seating. Fewer places is this more interesting than in Class B. In the Southern B Girls Tournament, the top three seeds come from three different conferences. A team that draws Lincoln Academy won't be able to ignore Payson Kaler, one of the better guards in the region. York only played 14 games, but the Wildcats will make you play end to end, and Emily Rainforth can fill it up. Yarmouth has the ingredients for a postseason run. Consistent scoring can be an issue, but Yarmouth can win in many ways. Spruce Mountain relied on the duo of Jasmine and Jaden Pingree to win a dozen games and earn the three seed. Oceanside is talented and experienced. Audrey Mackey, Anna Kingsbury, and Abby Waterman are all three-year starters. Between Mackey and freshman Bailey Breen, the Mariners have two players who average almost 20 a game. 
Wells is still the defending state champ, and they bring back seven players from that team. Grace Ramsdale is a missed basketball candidate, and point guard Grace Boucher is the quintessential point guard and one of the most underrated players around. All right, keep in mind, in the north, Old Town went 17-1. They're the number one seed. Their only loss came to the number two seed, Herman, which makes a recipe for a pretty good tournament when the top two seeds have split their games. Now, joining me tonight to help break down these 10 tournaments, our guest analyst, as always, Michael Hoffer of The Forecaster. Michael, thank you for joining me. And uh, we were talking in the office just a few minutes ago. Class B looks like it could be wild. Hey Travis, thanks for having me. It's great to be able to talk about tournament basketball again. It's been a long couple years, but yeah, I mean, Wells, they certainly are going to be wearing the bullseye going into the tournament, and I think they like it that way. I think the best thing that happened to them late in the season, losing that game to Greeley, uh, might have got them refocused and realized that they are the hunted even more than they might have thought, because there are some really good teams in this region, like you alluded to. You know, one potential matchup I'm looking at uh, in the semifinals, if the seeds hold, they could possibly play Yarmouth, and the first time those teams played, Yarmouth slowed down Wells quite a bit. Uh, Grace Ramsdale stepped up in the fourth quarter, as she always seems to do, and they managed to win that game. You know, the Warriors are still the favorites, and I, I think that senior group is going to settle for nothing short of another championship. And with Coach uh, Don Abbott leading the way, you have to like their chances. But it's not going to be easy because some of these other teams, Oceanside's kind of an unknown quantity down here, and you'll be curious to see how they play when they come down this way. And Yarmouth would have a first, or rather a quarterfinal matchup yeah. if they win their prelims with uh, York, which could be interesting. And Oceanside is tough. They have rolled through their season. Bailey Breen, maybe the top freshman in the state. She's unbelievable. All right, Michael, we have only just begun here on the Hoops 8 Tournament Preview Show. Much, much more to come, including a closer look at Maine's version of the human highlight film. Nokomis freshman Cooper Flag. This might be the only year he plays Maine high school ball. So thanks to our friend Trophy Mode, a look at some of his best finishes of the year. At the rim, with authority, more Hoops 8 special when we return.